My name is Gerard Kennedy. I am the chair of the Distinguished Visitors Lectures Committee here at the Faculty of Law at the University of Manitoba. And it's my enormous pleasure to virtually welcome you all to Robson Hall today. Robson Hall is located on Treaty One territory, the traditional homelands of the Cree, Oji Cree, Anishinaabe, Dakota, and Dene peoples. And we are deeply honored today to be hosting Helen Duffy uh, to give uh, us uh, our first distinguished visiting lecture of this term. Uh, Dr. Duffy has been a staff member of the Grotius Center since January 2015, when she became um, the Geiskis, and I should have asked you how to pronounce that properly because I'm sure I'm wrong, Professor of International Human Rights and Humanitarian Law at Leiden University in the Netherlands. Uh, a native of Ireland, as I think you will hear in the, when she starts talking. Uh, she has practiced international law, uh, mostly in the areas of international human rights law and international humanitarian law for over 25 years. And she brings an enormous amount of practical and scholarly expertise to today's topic. Uh, in, just so everyone knows, uh, this she's going to give us a lecture today. It will be recorded. Um, for internal use only. Uh, we will turn the recording off for Q&A, which my colleague, Dr. Shell Anderson, will moderate. And with that, it's my enormous pleasure to turn it over to Dr. Helen Duffy. Thank you so much. Well, I must say it's really an honor, uh, a privilege to be with you. Of course, I'm not really with you, but I am in spirit and uh, I very much wish I could be there. Um, though now that you've reminded me about the weather, I think maybe I'll come in uh, July the next time if we could just uh, do the, the repeat invitation for that time. Uh, but it, it really is, is a great pleasure um, to have the opportunity to chat to you all today um, about uh, this uh, not very edifying, but I think incredibly important conversation around uh, the war on terror, past, present and future. Now, before I start, I'm going to have to very rude and correct our host on one thing. Well, maybe first of all, you know, the, the distinguished thing, I'll leave that for others to determine. I'm not sure that applies, but I'm Scottish actually and not Irish. Now I say that um, my family, some of them came from Ireland. I'd be very proud to be Irish. It's just a fact and facts matter, as we know in the war on terror, where <laughs> there's been so much misinformation in our post-truth world. So there we are. I'm Scottish, not so distinguished, but very privileged nonetheless to, to be with you. Um, I've got a little PowerPoint to share with you um, in order to gather my thoughts on this uh, rather amorphous topic of the war on terror. So I'm just going to share my screen in order to be able to do that uh, with you now. Uh, let me see. Of course, I can no longer find the share screen. There we go. Excellent. And I hope you can all see that. Okay. That screen. Yeah, fantastic. And um, so just to say, you know, as has been said, um, uh, I'm a practicing human rights lawyer for most of the time. So I'm a part time academic at the University of Leiden. Uh, but for for much of my uh, week and my year, I'm a practicing lawyer. Um, and I represent victims to bring um, cases to international and regional uh, courts and, and bodies. Um, I've been doing that in the context of counterterrorism as well as in a number of other contexts for, for many years. So even before uh, the terrible events of 9-11 and the beginning of what we often refer to as this so-called war on terror, um, I had been active in, in uh, cases on behalf of, of victims who'd had their rights violated in the name of security and terrorism. So of course, the war on terror wasn't the beginning. 9-11 wasn't the beginning of terrorism. Uh, and the war on terror was not the beginning of abuse of counter-terrorism. But it has been a particular moment in history, and I think it's worth reflecting on a few of the core characteristics of uh, the war on terror, uh, past and present. And then I'd like to invite you to reflect on the implications of that uh, for the future. So I've called my talk uh, Past, Present and Future, of course, I don't really know what the future of the war on terror is because none of us know what the future is. Um, but I think it is important to reflect 
on this, not as a historical question. And that's what I wanted to really underscore in the title. Um, the war on terror is not something that happened after 9-11. It's very much um, alive, thriving and expanding. Um, so as we look to the past and in, in highlighting some of the core characteristics of the war on terror, I will invite us to look to the past, to some of the practice and evolution, but also to think about what form does that take to do? So to what extent do what I see as some core characteristics that I'm sure we'll all identify as core characteristics of counter-terrorism practice globally in the past 20 years? How do those manifest today? So the past and the present is very much um, running together in this ongoing war on terror. And what does that mean for the future? So the characteristics I've highlighted are ones that I think are very emblematic of the past 20 years of the war on terror since 9-11, continuing to the present with uncertain implications for, uh, for the future. Um, maybe just a couple of um, introductory remarks, uh, if I may, in relation to uh, our topic. I'm going to focus in particular on the human rights um, implications or impacts of counterterrorism today. And I feel that I, I, in order to do that, I need to focus in on three topics. The last time I wrote a book on this, I ran for a thousand pages, and that was one side deleted a third of the book. So I can talk for far too long and write for far too long because it's an enormous topic. So I really just wanted to recognize the breadth and the depth of the issues that arise in this context before we go on to highlight and look at a few of them. Um, if I were to ask you to think about um, human rights and the war on terror, uh, what springs to mind? What would you immediately think of in terms of the human rights implications of the war on terror. Um, we might think, for example, first of all, you might immediately think of the most notorious violations in the war on terror, maybe the, um, one, the image of one, uh, detainees at Guantanamo Bay. We might think of torture victims. I'll come back to one example of that later. We might think of arbitrary detention that's been widespread. We might think of the use of drones. We might think of people who've been specifically targeted for some of the most egregious violations of human rights that have been the most notorious, perhaps, in the war on terror. But we should also focus in here on this image of the, um, the iceberg and the sort of pyramid at the top of it, first of all. We should then recognise, of course, that the way in which the landscape has changed, um, the normative landscape, the political landscape, the institutional landscape, maybe the cultural landscape, and so many countries around the world, as a result of the securitization of more and more aspects of everyday life, we begin to see, I think, um, a broadening out of, of the impact, not only on these targeted individuals um, that are most, uh, whose cases are most notorious, but in a sense, of course, on families, on communities, on all of us, uh, when we think of the impact on our right to privacy, for example, um, of expanding surveillance practices. When we think about the way that criminal law has expanded, administrative measures being introduced around the world in a way that sets aside what we would normally associate as very basic procedural guarantees, for example, affecting more and more people, um, ultimately affecting all of us and the societies in, in which we live. And then, of course, I think there are, there are, are many other impacts that are perhaps less seen and less seen um, and that will be the kind of cultural impact and I, I think that's something for us to reflect on. I'm a lawyer so I stick to the boring legal stuff in my practice and my reflections for the most part um, but I do think we need to also reflect on, on how uh, the securitization of everyday life has impacted on the societies in which we live, has impacted on equality and on our, our relations as societies how it's impacted on our resilience as a society, whichever society we live. Um, and around the world, this is something that I hear in my research work and in my practice work more and more, the ways in which an emphasis on counter-terrorism has diverted resources away from other human rights work and um, that was really essential from peace-building work, for example, 
um, as well as from the defence of human rights. It's undermined and attacked the defence of human rights, and I'll give examples from practice of that later. But it's also eroded, in a sense, some of the fabric of our societies, the very resilience, some people would say, that we need to protect us from the many threats that we face today, including the threat of terrorism. So I just really wanted to recognise, because I'm not going to do justice to that reality, I think it's a very complex, um, if we're looking at impact, uh, the impact of the war on terror on, on an ongoing basis is diverse, it's deep, it's profound, it's seen and unseen, direct and indirect. That said, I'm going to focus in on my three characteristics and I, of, of the war on terror. And it won't surprise you to say, I think we briefly have to recognise the relevance of the war part of the war on terror. So I'm calling it the war that wasn't. That's because I'm a lawyer. I can come back to that. Um, secondly, um, second characteristic is the question of war on what? Uh, so there I'm looking at the scope of the war on terror. The scope and as I see it, the very insidious spread today of the concept of terrorism and associated concepts around the world. Um, and then thirdly, I'm going to look at the question of, of um, more directly our relationship between the past, the present and the future. And I'm going to look at the question of looking back or moving forward. Um, and what has the approach to evaluation in the war on terror, to reparation and accountability. And I think that together, um, as I'll come back to at the end, I think together these three characteristics epitomize or underlie a lot of the practice of the war on terror that has had a very profound effect on human rights and on the rule of law more broadly. First of all, the question of, of the war. And of course, what I'm talking about here is this reference to the war on terror. Now, it's tempting, in a sense, to dismiss the language of war on terror as just a rhetorical device. You know, and at one point in the early days when the war on terror language was first used post 9-11 by then President Bush, you know, many people were, of course, talking about, you know, is this analogous to the war on drugs, the war on obesity? This is just a rhetorical device. But of course, it isn't. It wasn't and it isn't very serious legal claim that has been sustained um, by the United States um, since the aftermath of 9-11, that there is uh, an armed conflict, legally speaking, uh, to which international humanitarian law is the applicable legal framework. Um, so the war um, has uh, legal implications that I'll come on to in a second. It also, of course, has practical implications. And what it foreshadowed was an emphasis on military responses. This is not only, of course, the war on terror, as I'm referring to it, is the global war on terror. And I'm looking at the responses globally of states around the world in, in my work, both my litigation work and my academic or research work. Um, and I think what, what we see around the world is um, one of the foremost criticisms of counterterrorism in the past 20 years has it been predominantly military nature, this overemphasis of on militarized uh, responses to war on terror and the implications of that uh, for other effect, for other uh, types of action that may, many people would say, have been more effective in that uh, effort to deal with um, the threats, the real threats from terrorism. Um, I'm doing at the moment a study on uh, counterterrorism in Africa, uh, trends and implications. I'm looking across the continent in various contexts and um, repeatedly in quite diverse contexts from active armed conflict situations to other situations, the predominant criticism that interviewees will bring forth Fourth is the militarized nature of counterterrorism. Um, so this is, is a real problem that's brought with it uh, increased, of course, use of violence and use of force, uh, many uh, very serious allegations of, of um, violations by the military in diverse contexts around the world, but also a confusion and conflation of paradigms of legal regimes um, and of our understanding of situations. Because what we've seen with this war on terror concept um, 
is a confusion and a conflation of when we are talking about armed conflict, to which of course we have a legal regime, international humanity when we are talking about counterterrorism, Now, sometimes, I'm not, not going to lie, the, con the, the context, the, sorry, the distinction is not always all that clear. This is a fact-specific analysis as to whether in any particular situation you have a genuine armed conflict to which IHL, humanitarian law, applies alongside human rights law. And clearly there have been, con there have been um, armed conflicts, genuine armed conflicts in the Soviet on terror, such as Afghanistan, among others, to which IHL does apply alongside human rights. But what we've also seen is this a notion, which to my mind has a no bearing uh, and no basis in international law, this notion of a global, potentially endless war on terror, a war on um, entities um, that cannot be clearly identified. So a war that is both geographically unlimited potentially limitless in scope and last forever, and against entities that cannot be clearly identified. That's a real anomaly um, as an international humanitarian lawyer, but of course IHL humanitarian law is intended to be an exceptional regime that covers real armed conflict situations and brings with it, of course, particular rules that are appropriate for that. And so the implications of that uh, are many, but just to flag a few, one of the most obvious ones is, of course, legal implications, right? That if we're referring to counter-terrorism in various parts of the world under the rubric of war or armed conflict, and we're going to humanitarian law as the primary um, legal regime, as, as many have done in particular in the United States, but elsewhere too, then, of course, um, it has implications for the right to life the absolute prohibition, uh, the prohibition on arbitrary deprivation of life um, has serious implications because, of course, the humanitarian law rules are different. Likewise, in relation to detention on grounds of security during conflict, the rules of IHL are different from uh, human rights. So I feel that this war paradigm is important. Of course, you could say, even if we hadn't called it a war, even if we hadn't been looking at IHL, um, there would have been these drone killings, the increase in targeted killings around the world, because the truth is, as the Special Rapporteur um, on extrajudicial executions mentioned at one point, this is not really a discussion about what the law lo allows. Um, instead, it's, a dis it's an effort to discard the law altogether, so it's violations of the law. Um, but clearly, I think we've paved the way for this kind of situation in which we are, where I think we are normalizing violations of the right to life. We're normalizing targeted killings and use of lethal force um, in a way um, that I think we could never have anticipated in the immediate aftermath of 9-11. I'll come on to Guantanamo, but likewise, uh, so-called threat-based or security-based detention um, purports to be based in IHL under this illusion of the global um, in other ways as well, I think the, this conflation of IHL and counterterrorism has been very problematic for the application of the legal framework um, and for a whole host of incredibly important action that's, that's underway around the world. Um, I'm thinking, for example, of, of peace building um, and increasing reports of how peace building is hampered by the association uh, with counterterrorism how humanitarian assistance in armed conflict situations is either banned or impeded or precluded um, as a result of we seem to be counter-terrorism uh, operations rather than uh, peace building or humanitarian assistance in armed conflict. So there's a confusion both ways with many I think, serious implications. And I think beyond that, we can also of course reflect on why was this war on terror paradigm put out there and why has it so tenacious. It's come and it's gone. Obama at one point said, we're not going to talk about the war on terror anymore. But the language re-emerges. And I think part of that is the symbolism, the discourse that it brings with it. Um, and that is, of course, a discourse of, of, uh, of war, of conflict, of militarization, of the enemy of what uh, my uh, uh, friend Bar Anzi, in a very interesting piece on the United States, has talked about the ideology of war that's permeated so many different aspects 
life in the United States since 9-11. Nothing interesting is seen in this one. So number one, we have the war. The war that isn't really a war, but um, it's there. The second one that I want us to focus, focus in on, and this is something that I, I see uh, in a very pronounced and vibrant or frankly terrifying way in my practice um, in different contexts of the world, and that's questions around the scope and the spreading reach of the target. So if we're at war, what are we at war with? All of the measures that are being adopted around the world, this proliferation of laws, practices and policies, exceptional measures against terrorism that have um, been adopted internationally and nationally around the globe. And we have a fundamental problem to begin with that will not be a surprise, I'm sure, to any of you. And the fundamental problem is the problem of lack of definition and clarity around those targets. What are we talking about in our counter-terrorism? Um, we could start, of course, with the lack of an internationally accepted definition of terrorism. This is well known, probably well known to, to many of you. Uh, we can talk about that if you wish. I won't go through that in detail or we really will be here all day. But suffice to say, there is no internationally agreed definition of terrorism, despite enormous efforts for many decades um, to adopt such a definition. The definition has been too politicized, it's been too subjective, it's been too problematic in many different ways, and there is no international agreement on what terrorism means. Despite the fact that after 9-11, I think many of us thought, given the renewed emphasis on international cooperation around terrorism, that would change, but remarkably it hasn't. Instead, what we've seen since then is what I prefer to hear as a layering up of indeterminacy. So we have this war on terror and we, we can't quite agree on what the terror is or terrorism is. And we have a layering up as the war on terror, as counter-terrorism has developed, with other indeterminate terms, other undefined concepts that expand and broaden out the scope in very significant ways. Of course, measures taken in the name of national security, uh, references to terrorists and to foreign terrorist fighters. We often see also now references to extremists, right? We talk about terrorists and extremists. In some contexts, like the Shanghai Cooperation Agreement, we see the reference now is to terrorist extreme, terrorist separatists and extremists. So we see increasing indeterminacy. Um, we also see terrorism itself being defined in practice in lots of different contexts in a way that makes it broaden out in very considerable and important ways, reaching further back into the time. So we'll therefore call people, particularly in the context of criminal law, which I've written about because I think it's particularly troublesome that criminal law would be used in this way. Um, but we see terrorism being defined in, in, in criminal law and elsewhere in a way that, that reaches further back in time and further out. So more and more remote action from any terrorist act can be called um, terrorism if it is supportive of terrorism, if it's seen to contribute or to create an environment in which terrorism can flourish. So we have crimes of preparation, of course, but we also have crimes of expression on the increase, crimes of support for terrorism, justification, apology, association. Uh, many of these crimes, in my view, pose really fundamental rule of law problems. They undermine the rule of criminal law, but even beyond criminal law, um, they, they pose very serious legality issues as to what do these terms mean? What does it mean to justify or apologize for terrorism or support terrorism? Um, and undermine, of course, many basic rights such as freedom of expression and association, most obvious as well, and the principle of legality itself. I'll set up here one example of that in terms of the, how we see the legal development kind of spreading out here. Um, and I've used the crimes of expression example. So we saw the Security Council at a certain point referring to the prohibition of incitement to terrorism. And of course, states must then likewise um, prohibit 
incitement to terrorism. Well, that's okay if you define terrorism in a certain way, but of course terrorism wasn't defined by the Security Council or anywhere else. Incitement wasn't defined either. And then what we see is a, a, a kind of um, fanning out for that, uh, that means or a clarification in a, in a way that expands, I think, notion of incitement beyond the way that it would at least normally be used in my experience in criminal law. So we see incitement, for example, in the EU directive on combating terrorism. Oh, sorry, gone too far. Um, referring to it in, in quite a broad way as embracing glorification and justification of terrorism, for example. So not the sort of incitement, a direct call to commit an act of violence, but rather a justification of terrorism. Now, if terrorism is broadly defined or not defined at all, um, then what is it to justify terrorism? In a sense, we have this very nebulous, undefined um, uh, legal norms nationally, sorry, internationally, regionally, and then spreading further on the national level, where we've seen states really take advantage of this flexibility and enact extremely broad reaching laws, often in reference to uh, the satisfaction of their obligations towards the Security Council. Um, and on the national level, we see um, many examples of laws of propagandization for terrorism, glorification for terrorism. We saw that criticized uh, by the UN Human Rights Committee in relation to the UK, for example. I believe it's also been an issue in Canada, but there'll be experts there on that. And I, I'm not uh, on the Canadian system. Justification for terrorism we've seen adopted and very widely used um, in a number of different states. Apology for terrorist acts. There are some remarkable examples of what constitutes apology, uh, like the Spanish cases of someone uh, tweeting um, a joke about something that not, not a good joke, I'm not saying it was a good joke, but tweeting a joke about um, a terrorist act in the 70s, saying that someone went back to the future in the context of um, an explosion. Now, of course, that would be very offensive to you if you were the people um, affected by that. But is that really incitement to terrorism that deserves the, the special um, opprobrium and, and weight of criminal law? So many examples, moral support in Ethiopia, um, individuals being prosecuted for moral support for terrorism. Very interesting criminal law cases. So we see these expansions in law and, and then in practice, if I can just refer quickly to, to some of the work um, that I've been doing in my practice. I'm lucky enough to work with something called the Turkey Litigation Support Project, where we bring a number of cases um, seeking to, to support um, lawyers in Turkey to bring strategic uh, litigation in relation to human rights violations. And of course, as I'm sure many of you will know, I mean, Turkey in a sense is, is really, um, really epitomizes, I think, the abuse of uh, counter-terrorism laws um, by um, a regime that, that really the, the, the law is being used as a, a tool of repression, we could say, as a, as a tool to kind of silence dissent. Um, I've referred to it here as, as um, dismantling democracy, because what we see is a series of prosecutions and, and calls for down to expressions of dissent by different democratic actors. So a couple of the cases that I've been involved in, in in practice recently, one of them is called the Academics for Peace case. So who were the terrorists here? They were um, a bunch of academics who got together and signed a petition expressing their concern about conflict in southeast uh, Turkey. They were then prosecuted for propagandizing for uh, terrorism, uh, dismissed from their positions and live in what's been described as, as a type of civil death where it's really very difficult for um, those who've been dismissed from public service and from academia to operate in society. We also have very notorious examples of politicians in Turkey, likewise, um, through uh, their political work, their expressions of political opinion, um, being uh, detained and prosecuted for terrorism. Um, the European Court of Human Rights has condemned that um, and told Turkey that it must release Turkish politician, um, Kurdish politician Demirtas, but uh, 
Turkey's refusal to do so. We have journalists, we have act activists, we have a number of other cases. We have members of the public being prosecuted for terrorism for expressing concern on TV about the killing of children in southeast Turkey. So we have, I think, many examples. We can think about Kazakhstan very much in the press at the moment and a matter of very serious concern. Um, the allegations of, of hundreds being detained, hundreds of protesters being detained. What was the first word that was used? 1 a.m. by the mayor. Uh, we're going on a counter-terrorism operation to stop these terrorists who are protesting. So the protest was quashed in the name of counter-terrorism and individuals are now detained and are being prosecuted uh, also under terrorism laws for protests. Um, many examples from across the African continent and the Middle East. Um, I think one of the most, perhaps we could say ridiculous, that weren't so serious was the, um, uh, the use of counter-terrorism laws um, against doctors in the context of the COVID pandemic and the reactions um, in, uh, in Egypt. So any form of consent uh, in the scientific context, in the of dissent, sorry, scientific, uh, political and other and we're seeing that the creation, now these are extreme examples, but I think they are in a sense typical of something that is happening globally, which is the spreading reach of this nebulous concept of terrorism and associated crime. These are some images of some of the examples, of course, of the terrorist state. Um, and this includes journalists, includes Sultanic, the Spanish rapper who got three and a half years, it includes indigenous uh, rights groups in Chile, where the Inter-American Court has criticized them, being uh, treated as terrorists. It includes human rights lawyer Tahir Elche at the bottom here, who was being uh, prosecuted for propagandizing for terrorism before he was killed uh, five years ago. And we have uh, women's rights groups, of course, have also been uh, labelled as terrorists and precluded from their operation. Here we have the, the very famous, I'm sure, uh, example of Saudi Arabia of women asserting the right to drive and terrorism may be arising in that context too, um, as has been discussed by the UN Special Rapporteur and journalists uh, down at the bottom. Okay, so moving on before I take too long and so we have time for discussion, I just want to get to the last uh, characteristic um, that I want to, to refer to today. And, and this is the question, I think, that deals most directly with um, the past, the present, and the future. And it's the question of, of reparation accountability and um, the re-evaluation deficit in the war on terror. Um, there is no doubt, I think, um, that the war on terror has given rise to the most serious violations of Rights. That much seems to be plain and un uncontroversial. Um, we have, in a sense, been, as I said at the beginning, emblematic of and, and uh, defining features of the war on terror. Very much linked, I think, to another sub-feature I'd like to put in there of othering, um, enabled perhaps when we think about the torture or arbitrary detention for life, enabled by this othering perhaps associated with the concept of the enemy that I mentioned before, but the demonization and the dehumanization of, of human beings. Um, and many examples think of torture and forced disappearance of persons, arbitrary detention um, being justified um, in the name of countering terrorism, gathering intelligence, uh, keeping us all safe. Um, what are the rule of law responses to the sort of very egregious violations such as systematic torture that we've seen in, in the war on terror? Um, the rule of law, by which, of course, we mean the application, the consistent application of international law, including international human rights law, is quite clear as to the requirements in the face of um, serious allegations of violations of human rights, such as uh, systematic torture. And these would include the obligation to investigate, the obligation to hold individuals to account, the obligation of reparation. And the obligation of reparation includes, first and foremost, bringing to an end those violations, compensating, recognizing, 
pharmacology perhaps as part of that. And then taking measures to ensure non-repetition. So ensuring that these violations do not arise again. All of that is enshrined within the notion of reparation in international law, enshrined, for example, in the UN basic principles on reparation. So the legal framework is there in terms of how um, states around the world should respond to serious violations, such as um, the notorious violations of Guantanamo Bay or of CIA uh, systematic torture, for example. But they're starkly absent in practice. And I just wanted to refer one of my clients' cases, I think, epitomizes uh, this situation. So I'd refer to the situation of Abu Zubaydah, who is uh, one of my clients who's uh, currently detained in Guantanamo Bay. Um, Abu Zubaydah's case is, is very notorious because he was uh, one of the first so called high value detainees who was taken into the CIA rendition and torture program in the aftermath of 9-11. And he was very brutally tortured at the hands of the CIA. Um, he was held in a series of so-called secret black sites around uh, the world. Um, he himself was captured in Pakistan. He was detained and tortured in Thailand, went on to Lithuania, to Poland, to Morocco, to Afghanistan, and off to Guantanamo Bay. Um, his torture is very well recorded and that there are, um, there is ample evidence, there is now abundant evidence of his torture. And um, recently, some of you may know, there is now even a documentary about it. There have been a number of articles that have been written about his torture, there's a documentary. Finally, um, his own images of his torture, which is what I've put on the screen here, um, have been and declassified so that they can be shared with you. And this is one image of all of the torture, including uh, the waterboarding that he was systematically subject to, his um, unlawful confinement uh, for many days in a coffin-shaped uh, box, and um, his physical abuse of many types, which I won't uh, go into, but is available um, uh, if you are interested, um, publicly available. Great deal of information about what happened to him and about um, those who were responsible for it. So, what has happened to Abu Zubaydah? Well, he was transferred to Guantanamo Bay after being systematically tortured by the CIA with the help of all of these other states on whose territory he was held. Also, with the help of some states that provided questions, like the United Kingdom provided questions to be put to Abu Zubaydah while he was being tortured. So there are many states that share responsibility for uh, what happened to him in CIA detention. But he was then sent on to Guantanamo Bay in 2006, and in Guantanamo Bay, he's been detained ever since with no charge, no trial, no review of the lawfulness of his detention. So my purpose here is not, uh, this is another thing I could talk about for several weeks, so I, I won't do that. Uh, it's not to talk in detail about his case, but I do think that the case um, raises a number of important questions about the war on terror and about how we approach uh, reparation in the war on terror. So I said that reparation is partly about cessation. So this person who we know was systematically tortured and who's never been charged with any crime is still held in arbitrary detention in Guantanamo today. We also know that many states share responsibility for that. Um, but the fact is that continues to the present day. So there hasn't even been a bringing to an end of these violations. Um, on top of that, what about all the reparation that we talked about? Well, we've taken cases to the European Court of Human Rights against uh, Poland and Lithuania, for example. Um, and have got very powerful judgments that have made clear that those states must investigate and prosecute uh, and hold to account and provide reparation and make representations to the United States to bring to an end what the court called the flagrant denial of justice in his case. However, in practice, what has happened, he has been paid compensation very recently by Lithuania, which is positive and some recognition for him. Um, but there has been no investigation by those countries or by the United States 
And so the fact is at the moment, there has been no thorough investigation, despite all of the information that's publicly available about the CIA programme and unlawful detention and torture on an ongoing basis at Guantanamo. No one's been held to account for that. I think the only person who's done any time, shall we say, for um, anything to do with the rendition programme was the CIA individual, uh, John Kariakou, who's accused of having uh, revealed information about the CIA programme. Um, so there's not been anyone held to account for their role in systematic uh, torture and ongoing unlawful detention. Um, so I think that uh, says something um, about where we are in terms of reparation, even the most notorious cases um, where there's abundant evidence. Now, it's true that this was intended to be kept secret. We were never meant to know about um, CIA uh, rendition. We were never meant to have access to the sort of information that Guantanamo was intended to be offshore and out of limits. And of course, a positive thing that we can say about the war on terror is that we have moved in our understanding that we are, have continued, thanks to many actors around the globe, um, to parse open the truth and to have uh, some access to information. But we're still very far from having a full truth. We're still very far from investigation and accountability. And the fact is the violations um, continue today um, and despite many states sharing responsibility for the wrongs, they have not stepped up and shared their responsibility for bringing them to, um, to an end. I think the characteristics that I've highlighted, and it's just, I feel I'm just snatching at bits of a much more complex um, landscape, but I think the characteristics in a sense represent some themes that run through this war on terror, the othering, the dehumanization of individuals, and the extent to which fear um, and misinformation has been used uh, to enable torture, to enable Guantanamo to continue to today, to enable the terrorism label to be put on a whole host of activities as we've, we've seen, including um, legitimate and important activities that are happening around the world. In a sense, they all characterize uh, a certain arbitrariness, um, uh, and an exceptionalism um, in the application of rules. Um, and they are, in a sense, together, maybe the antithesis of the rule of law approach uh, to counterterrorism that we need to see for the future. Um, unfortunately, I would say a final characteristic of the war on terror has been, I think, the refusal to learn lessons from the past in order to build uh, for a more effective counterterrorism in the future. Um, I've talked about counterterrorism measures that have been unlawful, moral, but also unstrategic. And it is worth saying that one thing that we do see today that's an interesting development is we see an increasing chorus of recognition that so much of the war on terror has been counterproductive. And um, we see this in relation to the, the torture program where the US Senate Intelligence Committee said it did not give rise to actionable intelligence, although that was the basis on which the systematic torture was justified. We see in relation to Guantanamo, um, successively uh, it's been referred to as a recruitment tool uh, for violent organizations around the world, um, and yet it continues. Many people have pointed out uh, the counterproductivity of terrorism laws that are now being used to undermine civil society actors who we need in order to, as I said before, build more resilient societies to defend ourselves from the real threats, uh, the real threats um, that terrorism does pose, at least in, in many parts of the world. But unfortunately, although we recognise that counterproductivity, we don't seem as an international community to be able to learn lessons from um, so much of what's gone wrong uh, in the war on terror in, old, in order to build uh, a more effective human security approach um, for the future. So those were some opening remarks for me. Thank you very much indeed. I'll stop sharing and I would uh, very much welcome your, uh, your comments or any questions that you might have.